a few videos ago, I introduced to you the Brennerly Hobo Stove. Well, after considerable testing, I'm ready to give you the review. If you're interested, keep watching. Okay, quickly, before we head to the woods to start the testing, I have to tell you, this is my third attempt at putting this video together. So what you'll see is in the video, you may see clips from another video that I had previously recorded. All right, now let's go to the woods and start testing this stove. Okay, before we start talking about the stove itself, I just want to tell you in full disclosure that this stove was sent to me by the owner of the company, Tobias, and he does make these at a, in a cottage industry at his home in Germany. And I'm going to provide all the links to where you can find out more about the stove in the show notes below. So to start with, I want to thank Tobias for sending these to me, or this stove to me and the accessories that came with it. Now let's talk a little bit about the stove. You can see in its unassembled state just how small or flat it packs down to. This thing disappears into my backpack. You know, you wouldn't even know it's there, especially when its weight comes in at 7.7 .7 ounces. That's lighter than the titanium version of the Emberlet stove. Yet when it's assembled, it's got an internal capacity for wood greater than the firebox stove. And still, it's made out of stainless steel. That's pretty impressive. So the diameter of this, well, you know, maybe what I should do is assemble it for you, show you how easy it does go together, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the statistics on it and what it can do. So one of the cool things about this is it has a snap closure on the envelope, but the snaps, uh, the snaps placement is actually incorporated into the design of the stove. So the stove is secured inside the envelope, not that it's going to go anywhere anyway, right through the parts of the opening of the stove. So when you take the stove out of its envelope, it's actually being held shut right now by the crossbar. So if I take the two crossbars off from either end, the stove wants to spring open into shape because it is a spring steel. Now I'm going to show you the inside. I have to set the bottom plate and I'll tell you what I mean by that in a second. But I'm going to lean it up towards the camera because inside you should be able to see the fire grate itself full of holes. And that stands about, yeah, just about an inch off of a bottom plate right there that you can see that protects the ground from hot embers falling through the fire grate. The only thing is it's not dropped down into the final position. As you can see, it's not quite ready to drop down. So there's a couple of ways. I found it was a little bit challenging when I first got it because it's not sharp. It's not like I'm going to cut myself, but it's very thin. So it does, it can be a little hard on the fingers when you first get it. The easiest way is to smack it down and then you can reach in the edge here and just drop the plate into its final position. Now all I have to do is put the cross stand on top. So the cross stand, the two pieces that held it together, go together like that and sit on top they go to on top and you look at the clearance from the top of the stove to the top of the cross stand that allows for a tremendous amount of airflow through this stove that's one of the things i think one of the hallmarks of this is tobias is an engineer and this was engineered with just the right amount of openings all the way around the stove to maximize airflow and give you a very clean now it's not a wood gas stove and it's not a, a rocket stove although it has some height so it does have some of that rocket that chimney effect happening but it gives you a very clean, very fast, very efficient burn. And the height here allows me to feed sticks in through the top without taking the pot off, which is really quite nice. The other thing I like about the pot stand is look where the hook on to the edge of the stove itself. Sometimes when you get a fire going in a stove and you want to drop your cross stand on. It can be a little tricky lining it up without burning your fingers. This one just drops right on without any, any risk of getting my fingers burnt at all, which is quite nice. Now, when you look around the stove, you'll notice that in addition to the other openings, there are two more openings right here. Those are for use with uh, a gas stove. So this will, is designed to be used either with the Trangia gas attachment, the canister stove, or the Primus. So with one, the, the valve would come out through here, and with the Primus, you'll have the regulator come out through here. So that's what those two openings are for. So this stove will operate with wood primarily, which is the way I've been using it most, although I have used it with a gas stove to see how it would work. But it also works with a Trangia stove, and I'm going to show you the adapter plate for that, and with Esbit. So in order to convert this into an alcohol burning stove, I'll take the top bar off. 
and there's a drop-in plate with a center hole that is designed just the right size to accept the trangia and hold it just above, well, pretty much in the right position. I say pretty much because I'll explain in a second. And what you'll see is on the edge right here are little notches. They're actually designed to line up with the hinge and then there's some little studs, rivets or something holding or coming in through the sides to hold the transient plate in place. So I'll show you this in a few minutes time with the transient in it. I'm not going to show you any testing with the transient out here on this cold December day, but I will show you the results of my tests in the show notes below because I think you'll find them quite interesting. Now, astute observers will say right away when the transient stove is in there, the height from the top of the transi of the stove to the height to the top of the pot stand is greater than that magical one or one and a quarter inches that everybody seeks when they're trying to, you know, set the right distance above the stove. And you would be correct. But I did testing with this pot stand and with two ad well, an, an additional pot stand that Tobias did send along. I know when you look at this, you're going to look like this is a bit of an afterthought. Um, maybe it is, but it's well thought out just the same. Tobias sent along two little pieces of rectangular aluminum tubing, piping, whatever you want to call it, that are designed to set on top of the stove and give you a closer to that one magical inch clearance above the stove. It also brings the pot down so there's less air moving over the top of the stove and robbing some of your heat away. There are specific heights to the pot stand in that dimension and in that dimension again I'll put it all in the show notes below so I tested it with the full-size pot stand I tested it with these two pot stands at that height and with them on edge and I got some very interesting results I think you'll you will agree what uh, just quickly with the full height pot stand I was able to bring two cups of water or 500 mils of water to a boil very quickly but it went through all its fuel with these pot stands and the higher setting as it is right now, I was able to bring the two cups of water to a boil a little slower than the full height pot stand, but I had some fuel left over. And when I laid them down flat, I had a little slower time again, but I had much more fuel left over. And I'll put those uh, results in the show notes, and if you're interested, I'll show another video at a future time of this using the alcohol stove. I did mention Esbet. If you've been following my channel for any length of time, you're likely aware that I'm not a fan of Esbit. <coughs> I, I want my Esbit or anything I use to boil water to do exactly that, bring water to a boil. Because when I'm out in, in, on the trail and I'm looking for water, water sources, I have to be sure that I can bring water to a full rolling boil to make sure that I kill any pathogens that are in that water. I have found very few Esbit designed stoves that will do that. One cup of water, yes, but why two cups of water? Well, most of my dehydrated meals or my freeze-dried meals take about two cups of water. So I have to feel comfortable knowing that I can bring two cups of water to a boil. As I said, that has not been my experience with Esbit, especially as it gets cold. Um, this is the first stove, I'll be perfectly honest, that I was able to do that with. And I'll put the results of that test in the show notes below. But here's the plate that drops in to the same place. There we go. Drops into the same place in the stove as the one did for the Trangia and gives you almost a perfect height for the Esbit tablet. And again, you can use, either use the full height cross stand or those little ones that go with it. All right, one more thing that I want to mention that uh, Tobias sent along and does come with the stove when you purchase it is he sends a little package of Esbit tablets and a good instruction booklet. Mind you, it is in German, but that's not hard to translate with the Google Translate, of course. And a little lighter that you can use to light your Esbit stoves or whatever. Primarily, I use this with wood, and that's what we're going to do today. I'm going to set it up here in this cold uh, late December day, and we'll get a fire going and put my lunch on. Okay, to save just a little bit of time, I preloaded the stove so that I can do a bottom-up burn. So what I've done is inside, you won't be able to see it now, is I started with some birch bark that I collected from just around my immediate area. And then on top of that, I have some small fine twigs, some maple and a little bit of spruce, just what I could find right close at hand. And then it got a little larger. Then I have some splits of maple that I cut from a dead standing here that I'll add as the fire gets going. To light this stove today, I am going to be using my Uberlieben 
tinder wick, which I have used a good number of times now. It's getting quite short. And what I'll do once I get it lit is I'm going to stick it in through here because the flame will catch the, the birch bark at the bottom of the stove and the fire will move up. Now, just to be clear, I have used this a good number of times with top-down burn and bottom-up burn and both work equally effective. I'm not going to say one is necessarily better than the other. They both work very well. Let's see if I can catch this on camera. Didn't get it the first time. That's better. Now, I'll just slide this in. And once I know that, well, it's not going to take long at all. Once I know that the birch bark underneath has caught, I can see a little flame coming up through, or I'll withdraw it. I can even put this pot stand on now. Are you catching? I believe so. I can, yeah, that looks like it's cut inside. Okay, as the fire catches on, because it will take a minute or two for it to work its way up through, a couple of observations that I've had on using this over the last couple of months, and what, oh, look how quickly that's coming up through. One of the things I've noticed is, I don't know if I showed it, it was that the fire grate did warp a little bit inside. Must have been a little damper than I thought it was, the wood. The fire grate did warp a little inside. It effect, neither affects it when it's in use, neither, and it does not affect it when it's in storage. It uh, works equally well by that. You know, I don't think that was totally unexpected considering that how thin the stainless steel is here, but, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's only a small thing. It's more aesthetic than anything else. Look how quickly that's come to a, to a nice rolling boil, or nice fa rolling boil fire. I think I better get my glove on for this. So I'll put my pot of water on. Something I bought for myself to test out, which is an 1100 milliliter titanium pot from Tom Shoe. And uh, I'm quite enjoying it so far. You can see I've used it a few times. It's not going to take very long for that to bring that water to a boil. You know what I failed to do when I was talking a few minutes ago and describing the stoves was to give you some of the measurements and I, as I said I will put them in the show notes below. But basically it is a six and three quarter inch high from the bottom up and a five and a half inch diameter. In reality, the burn chamber is about five and a half inches deep and about five and a half inches in di diameter, making it just a little bit larger than the firebox stove. I think I better put my glove back on for this. But you can see how easy it is to feed pieces of wood in without having to remove the pot at all. And because it's five and a half inches, you can get some pretty long pieces of wood in there as well. I'll let that catch and then I'll add more as needed. I don't think I'm going to need much more than that. Uh, what else can I say about it? Okay, the bottom plate in the stove, the one that's meant to catch the hot embers, is only about a quarter of an inch, maybe less, off of the ground itself. It catches the embers well, but it will still transfer a lot of heat through to the ground below. So. Normal precautions apply here as well with, as with any stove. Be sure of the surface you have underneath your stove. Be sure that it's fire safe so that not too much heat transfers through. It's minimized by that plate, but it's not eliminated, the risk that is. So right now I'm using this in a fire pit that uh, I have here, and I use the fire pit mostly well. One, I know this, the foundation is safe, but also as a, as a windbreak as well. I have to keep my eye on this. I think that's water is getting pretty close to a boil. Hot, bubbles rising, but not ready for boil, yeah. All right, so I just enjoyed a, quite a tasty lunch, but then I realized, what's lunch without coffee? So now, rather than rebuild the fire up, I thought I'd show you how this works with the trangia. So let me drop the ring inside, so it doesn't go down very far. Just have to line it up with the two hinges, so you can see that's as far as it goes down. My Trondia, I need to put a little bit more fuel in it than what's in it now. There 
uh, about an ounce of alcohol and I'm gonna have to get the burrs out I guess so I don't need to put them on until after I get this stove lit of course and then I'll get the pot on what I'll do for this is just to take a little piece of burr spark something a little longer Ah, oh, here we go something longer Get it a little damp with alcohol, light it, get the main party body of it going, but it didn't. <laughs> going now? Now it's going. Okay. I'll put the two burrs on. And as soon as that comes to a bloom, I'll put my little pot of water on. So basically, that's all there is to it. You know, actually, there's no reason. People do that all the time. There's no reason to wait for your trangia to come to a bloom. As long as it's not going to be so close as to put it out, you're kind of wasting alcohol if you uh, wait for the bloom to come. I mean, it's going to work at its most efficient when the bloom is on. But you don't have to wait. So there you go. It's now, the pot is on. Not quite centered. Pot is on. Medium height. A little lower than the cross stand, the stainless steel cross stands, but if I had turned those two aluminum burrs on their side, I would have brought it just a little bit closer again to the to the flame. But that's close enough. Won't take very long now to bring my water to a boil, then I can have a cup of coffee. So I let the Brennerley hobo stove burn down to pretty much just coals in the bottom and then just added some of the larger chunks of wood back into it because I wanted to see if it would retain enough heat and enough airflow that it would reignite those pieces of wood. And it did. It took a little while for them to heat up enough that they combusted, but it was allowed me to have a new fire, I guess, or a reinvigorated fire so I could bring some water on boil for a coffee to end off the meal that I had. But then I let it burn down, and it burnt down to very little white ash in the uh, bottom of the stove, which I just dumped out. One of the nice things that I've discovered about this being very thin weight spring stainless steel is that it doesn't retain a lot of heat after use. So when the fire is out, this cools down very quickly, which means you can get on your way that much quicker. All right, let's talk a little bit about the stove in terms of who is this for? So what I can tell you about the stove is that it is a very lightweight, a very compact stove, very efficient in burning, is very versatile in terms of its being able to use uh, alcohol, as well as gas canister stoves, as well as, as Esbet or other hexamine fuel tablets. It seems to work equally well with all of those. In fact, as I mentioned, it's the best stove I've ever used for using with hexamine. Uh, I will tell you this, it's not cheap. I will annotate the price below in the, uh, in the show notes below and probably right on the screen. I believe it's worth about 90 euros and I'll exchange that into Canadian and US dollars. And there will be some shipping on top of that. So this is not a stove for everyone. This is a stove for someone who's looking for a lightweight efficient stove and is willing to pay a few extra dollars. It is not titanium, but it is stainless steel, so it's not going to rust. And I can't say this will last for 30, 40 years. Not like a firebox stove would probably last multiple generations. But so far, with the dozen or so fires that I've had in this, other than that minor warping of the fire plate inside, uh, I see absolutely no deterioration in the stove at all. In fact, it seems to be springier now <laughs> that I've had multiple fires in it than it was before because of its heating and cooling in the round shape so that when I take it apart and put it back into its flattened shape, it's a little bit more resistant to that, which is actually kind of a good thing. All right, let me do exactly that. Take this apart, show how easy it is to take apart and put back in its envelope and then of course we'll close the video up. So start by taking the pot stand off. I'll have to lay it down. Hold my envelope over here. The simplest thing to do is turn it upside down and just tap it. And when you tap it, it folds flat. And then I'll take my pot stands, one on either end. I'll show you how they fit on in one second. Nope, that's not it. This is it. 
until you get the second one on, it's a little springy and wants to resist what you're doing, but once you get the second one on, it holds together very well. All right, there we go. Okay, so you can now see how the pot stands act as the clips to hold it on or hold the stove flat. Both ends. Slide that inside the envelope. With cold fingers. All right, there we go. And I wanted to show you up close the snap, so you can see where the snap is right here, and when you fold it over, the snap works right through the opening on the stove to close up. And that's all there is to it. Ready to pack away and use for another day. All right, so what are my final thoughts on the Brennerly Hobo stove? This is a great stove. I think it is primarily intended for ultralight hikers or people who want a great, efficient, ultralight stove that they can take with them and are willing to pay a few more dollars. As I mentioned, it's lighter than the titanium emberlit stove, yet still has a firebox larger than the, the firebox stove, or, you know, a chamber larger than the firebox stove. So, as I said before, I'll put all the information about where you can find out more about the stove in the show notes below, but if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments section. But until next time, get out and explore and take that path less traveled. It'll make all the difference. Bye for now.